So today we're tackling worship, worship 101. If it was a college class, it'd be the entry level. And next week we're going to have worship 201. We really should go through a whole litany of services to be able to actually and effectively cover worship according to the Word of God. But I'm doing this in the direction of the Holy Spirit today and next Sunday as we lead into homecoming, which will also be a day of worship. So we're going to start with the Word of God. Psalms 150, verse 6, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And some of them actually say, Praise ye the Lord and follow. Most of you know the word. And if we're going from Genesis to, re I was going to say renovations, although sometimes our hearts need renovated. When we go from Genesis to revelation, the word would be revelation. Right in the middle, right smack in the middle is chapter 150 of Psalms. And we go from Genesis and the Bible talks about the need and the desire of God to be praised and he wants to be praised and he deserves to be praised. And then right in the middle is Psalms. And Psalms is a book of praise. It's a book of Psalms. And he gives us that to get to the rest of the Bible, the New Testament, and so on, and from our lives today until the time we get to heaven. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I don't know if you've ever seen it, and I used to have it on my phone's camera, and I somehow deleted it, but as a picture of a wave that is just thrust up to what looks like an evening moon. And I want someone to capture that and paint it. I have a very good friend, Kara and Mark, and I have a friend named Jer. Um, thank you, Joshua. Lord, I need help, because things just aren't flowing too well right now. I have a friend whose name is Joshua Fletcher, who's an artist. And he's, he's great at many things, but he's an artist. I want him to capture that picture for me. Because the Bible says that if we don't worship him, he'll cause the rocks and, and the mountains to cry out. And it's a perfect example of what I think that the water would look like reaching up to heaven in a matter of praise. So I did the etymology on the word worship. Etymology is the study of words. Entomology is a study of insects. That is not for today. Worship is a compound word made up of two words, worth, to be something of value, respect, condition of being worthy, offering honor, glory, understanding the dignity. And the suffix of ship is quality of condition, dignity, skill, referring to entitlement, where people of bodies of individuals can do so either participate actively together or alone. So you take worth and ship and put them to, together, and you get worship. It's reverence paid to a divine being, offering respect, worthy of honor by virtue of the character and the individual's dignity. And it can be done corporately or individually. Does it help you understand the word worship just a little bit more? You can put 150 back on the screen again, but I'm going to read the entire chapter because I want us to understand exactly what was being said by the psalmist when he was telling us, here are the ways you can worship. And it starts off with, praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament or of the expanse of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with string instruments and pipes. Praise him among the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. And we end with the one we started with, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When we stop and think about it, we all worship. We all clap at something. I like to clap for uh, Christian McCaffrey, even though he's not a panther anymore. When he left our team to go across the country, his whole career just opened up, and that guy blossoms and runs and catches and blocks, and I love clapping for him. 
We all shout about something. We all lift our hands at something. We all sing at some time. Now, if we could do all those things outside of the church, then why do we not do them in the church, surrounded by family, and doing simply the things that God has asked us to do? We clap. You're taking your first steps. It's so beautiful. Get the camera quick. I want to show Nana and Nini and Moo Moo and Pee Pee and Papa, whatever their names are now. <laughs> I grew up with Grandma and Grandpa. These, these other ones are kind of weird. Or if you're in Little League, whether you're the coach, the kid, or the parent on the sideline, swing batter, swing batter, woo! And if he strikes out, you buy him ice cream and you take him home. You can shout, hey, neighbor. Oh, yeah, we, yeah we, we don't want to boo the umpire, especially if it's me. We do shout out, hey, neighbor, get your dog's gift off my yard. We lift hands. Hey, over here. I'm over here. I'm open. You can see me. Throw it here. Pass it here. Or if your coach told you in basketball to get your hands up. And all of us, I don't care who we are, sing Christmas carols. I don't care how bad we think we are, how cool we think we are, how bad we think we sing, we all sing Christmas carols. So I'm going to try to be loud as I step back here to give you an example of what we do outside the church that we can do inside the church. some reason we do not do and I think sometimes that breaks God's heart In 1976 for one day for one class I was placed in journalism 101 I'm going to put that up on the screen that's a really good looking there you go 
I was in journalism for one class because I had just moved into the area and I was supposed to be put in band. I was not put in band, so I had to sit in journalism class that one 49-minute period. But the funny thing is, this is 1976, it's now 2024, and I still remember this lesson. The teacher got up, hit the board with that long pointer. In journalism, you always try to find the truth. That was journalism in 1976. And, <laughs> and you always want to answer as many of the following questions as possible. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. And in journalism, they're known as the five W's and H. I don't remember anything else about that class, but I've never forgotten those. I think sometimes because God knew I was going to be a pastor, and he said, sometimes you need to answer some of these questions. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest condensed version of worship between this week and next week. This week we're going to do our very best to answer the first three questions. So our first question is who? Who are we to worship? Who deserves our devotion? Who warrants our attention? Who has earned our adoration? Who merits our focus? Who ultimately deserves our heartfelt praise and our genuine worship? It's none other than God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It is not, and let me repeat, it is not about us. It has never been about us, and it should never be about us. Because when we make it about us, then it becomes idolatry, and we're worshiping something other than God. And if we go back to Exodus and the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. I desire your worship. I am a jealous God. Worship me in spirit and in truth. Just a little bit ago during the offering, we played a clip for you from the McKinney sisters, and it was nothing but the blood. And that was a certain style, which you would probably call bluegrass, yes. I'm going to show you a couple moments of the same exact song done by a different artist in his band. Same words, if you play Michael W. Smith's version for me, please. I love this version because I think it was one of the biggest, boldest steps ever made in contemporary Christian music to continue to use a hymn that everyone loved and bring it into a new generation. Now, which one are you more naturally wanting to worship alongside? The McKinney sisters or Michael W. Smith? Same exact words presented in two completely distinctive and different styles. I'm sure we all have one opinion or another. They both had singing, they both had strings, one had cymbals and even the high sounding cymbals. Is there one that we like better than the other? Just based on your likes and dislikes, of course there is. 
Yet should our opinion of the style of music even matter when it comes to offering God our worship? Absolutely not. Because once again, it's not about us. I'm going to have him play one more snippet from Michael W. Smith, the same exact artist you saw, just a different song. Darren, if you would, please. snippet of song by the same artist of the previous tune and that chorus reminds us pretty poignantly it's all about you Jesus and if you caught that little part of the second part of the 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 chorus it says I'm sorry Lord for the things I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus Because in all reality, who are we here to worship? We're here to worship God. God is what matters. God is who matters. The song should never matter. The style of the song should not matter. The way it's presented, whether it's on a screen or a live band or a pianist like Christina or a guitar like Lee in a few weeks, it shouldn't matter how it's delivered. The artist, the song leader, the musical director should not matter. Having a full choir or an ensemble or a soloist or having no one in the front should not matter. The temperature in the building shouldn't matter. The weather outside shouldn't matter. Who's in attendance or who's missing should not matter. The misunderstanding you had with your spouse on the way here should not matter. What you had for breakfast, what you're going to have for dinner should not matter. All that should matter is that our hearts are humbled and focused and prepared to offer our very best. To the one who deserves our very best. And that should always matter in our worship. You know, the whole reason I'm even doing this is because sitting there a few months ago, God just said, why aren't you worshiping me? And I can never ask you to go somewhere where I'm not willing to lead you. This one's on me. Our hearts should matter. They should be humbled and focused and prepared to offer our best to the one who deserves our best. We should be open to give the one who's the most valuable the most valuable within us, presenting our unworthiness to the only one who is worthy, to sing, to clap, to lift our hands, and to shout. These are all forms of biblical worship and all forms that please God in worship because when we are obedient to him, we're doing what he's asked us to do. And every single time we are obedient to God, God blesses us. Question number two, the what? We really kind of already answered the question earlier, what is worship? Worship is our sincere reverence paid to God, offering respect because he is worthy of honor by virtue of his character. 
his mercy, his love, his forgiveness, his grace, him forgiving us life, for providing plans for our lives, for sacrificing his son in our place, for preparing a home for each one of us in heaven with him, and I can go on and on and on indefinitely. But you get the point. God is worthy of our praise. Worship or praise is when we intentionally place ourselves before God, making him our ultimate focus, and we open our hearts and minds to offer God the very best that we have. We lift our voices and we sing, whether we sound good or not, because the Bible says in Psalms 101, make a joyful noise, all ye lands, unto the Lord. So if you sound like Michael Buble in the shower, but Barney Fife when you come out of the shower, it doesn't matter. God still wants to hear your voice praise him. There's a lady by the name of Johnny Erickson Tata. Some of you may know her story. She dove into a, a stream at the age of 16, and the water wasn't deep enough, and she hit her head in a rock and immediately became paralyzed, and she almost drowned because she couldn't pull herself out of the water. Out of all of that, she began a ministry, and one of the ministries is that she takes pencils and markers and pens, and she puts them in her mouth and draws the most beautiful creations I can't do with my hands. That's a form of worship. We clap because the Bible says to clap. And we shout because the Bible says to shout. And we do what the word says to do, then our obedience pleases God, furthering, further enhancing our worship. We lift our hands, and doing shall we so surrender to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We lift our hands to give our best and to receive his best. There's a gentleman by the name of Sam Storms who listed this huge list of things that happened when we lift our hands. Some of them I liked, some of them I didn't think were appropriate for the message, so I took Sam's information and mine and put them together, but I wanted to give him the credit. When we lift our hands, there is definitely biblical precedent. So why don't we do it? As I have already read from Psalms, there are plenty more scripture to back up lifting of hands. It can be done in our praise and in our prayer, in private and in public. The word asks us to lift our hands in both our worship and in our prayers to God. It reveals our openness to the Father. The more open we are to God the Father, the more he receives and the more he can give. Our hands speak very loudly. When our hands are clenched, it shows that we're angry. When our hands are guilty, we wring them. When our hands are um, worried, we do the same. And when our hands are in our pockets, we don't really know what to do. We don't feel like we belong. When we lift our hands, we're pointing to the Savior. Again, it removes distraction and keeps our focus on him and only him. Worshiping him is the viaduct between God and his child that we need to keep the holy connection between the creator and his creation, us, so that we can accomplish his will in our daily lives. We want to know sometimes that we're worn out spiritually on Tuesday or Thursday, Friday, because we didn't worship God the way we should have Sunday morning, and we didn't worship him after church the way we should have in our homes. Lifting our hands shows our surrender and our vulnerability. Lifted hands shows we are completely willing to give and receive. We no longer have an agenda other than that of focusing our adoration on the God we serve. It confesses our dependence upon God. Like a small child wanting and waiting to be lifted up into daddy's strong and loving arms. How many of you parents and grandparents will refuse picking up your grandson or your, gra or your daughter when they're standing there, mama, papa, daddy, mama, whomever? We don't refuse that. We pick them up and we love them. And that's the same stance that we should have. Heavenly Father, I'm here. I'm praising you. Pick me up. Hold me. Lastly, question three, where? 
Worship can be done corporately or individually. It should happen in both. Why can't we do it here amongst family? Why do we care what anybody else is going to say if they look at us? It can happen in the privacy of our bedroom. It can happen in our prayer closet. It can be done with our Christian family in the sanctuary. It can be done by a stream or in a pasture. It can be done in the city or in a park. It can be done in wide open forests or in the smallest of prison cells. Remember, Paul and Silas were in a prison cell and worshiped so hard it caused an earthquake. I don't know if it was just bad singing or if God just said, you're free, but it worked. It can happen in a convention center or on a stadium. I was very blessed to give the benediction when Franklin Graham came to Kannapolis when they were still the Kannapolis Phillies. And we, we had 5,000 people in a place that sat 3,000. It can happen with our teams before games or band before competition. It can happen with our sisters at a ladies' meeting. It can be done in a hospital room or a hotel room. It can even happen beside someone's deathbed. Worship can take place in the classroom, with the boardroom, in our schools, at our jobs, even in our cars. Please don't lift both hands while you're driving. It can take place while you're cooking, while you're showering, while you're vacuuming, while you're picking up the present your neighbor's dog left for you in your yard. You see, worship can take place whenever we want it to happen. Worship should take place wherever we are. Remember, God is omnipresent, which means he is in all places at all times. And since it is him that will be our focus for our heart and our praise and our worship. And because God is everywhere at all times, then our worship can truly take place anywhere and at any time. Sometimes when Rachel and I go shopping, I'm pushing the cart because I need something to lean on and she's picking up every single object and I'm like, I only have so much money to spend. <laughs> but she literally does put most of it back we're just looking, we're just, we're just window shopping. But a song will come in my heart, and while she's doing her thing, I'm just silent and quiet and worshiping inside my heart. No one knows about it but myself and God. And sometimes that's the most precious opportunities of worship. In Romans, Paul says that there is nowhere we can go that will ever separate us from the love of God, and that alone should create a flame of desire to burn within us to worship him. But being that he is everywhere and nothing or no place can separate us from his love, then we can truly, openly, sincerely, unaffectedly, earnestly, selflessly, honorably, and honestly offer our heartfelt praise and our genuine worship to God anywhere we are at any time. Asbury College, about a year ago, had a worship service that lasted over six months. It started in their chapel and continued to go and continued to go and continued to grow. And I just kept moving because everyone had the heart of worship. Classes were canceled. Meetings were left open. The most important thing that could have happened did happen, and that was God was being worshiped. In our, in our school, in our, in our country. If you remember, just a few months ago, I presented a message that said our lifestyle should be part of our daily worship. That what we do, that what we say, how we think should be an automatic extension of worship to God. We don't have to be raising our hands in the church. We don't have to be on our knees by our bed, but we can be worshiping God in how we do what we do. So as we go about our day-to-day -day tasks and our responsibilities and our callings and whatever God has gifted us, let's do so in ways that we are obedient to and in honor of God. So how we treat the, rest, the wait staff at the restaurant. Not throwing up the international bird of happiness sign when somebody cuts us off in traffic. Being a blessing to one another, calling on someone be a blessing to a stranger, to pray for and with others, 
even how we give in the offering can be a powerful display of worshiping God. And hear me, I do not mean the amount we give. I'm talking about the heart in which we give. If we want to worship God, all we have to do is ask him. We've already been through a bunch of the scripture, so you know it's factual. You know it's true. You know it's biblical. If you want to know different ways of doing it than how you are doing it, then ask him. Or if you want the courage to lift your hands when you've never lifted them before, then ask him. If you have the courage to sing out, then sing out. Maybe you haven't clapped or yelled or shouted his name in praise and worship before. God will give you the strength and the desire to do it. The Bible says, ask, knock. Those things will be revealed to us. The Bible also says, with, with man, these things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. If we ask, he will show. He desires our worship. And he inhabits the praises of his people, which should be us. I'll tell you how important praise and worship is to someone whom I have had in my life. There's a man by the name of Jack Stroud who passed away recently. Kara got to go to the funeral yesterday. Lee, who will be here with us in a few weeks, did the music. He was told about two and a half years ago he had six months to live of cancer. And six months went by and it became a year. A year went by, 15 months, 18 months. Two years went by and he was still alive. It wasn't long after that two year mark that the doctors were concerned about things and saw he was not healing, he was not progressing further in health. And they had taken him off all his medications. And when that happens, that usually means they're not going to do any more to make him uncomfortable before he passes. His bucket list was two other friends of mine, both on staff at Crossroads Church, Bobby and Lenny. And on his bucket list, he wanted to go to the highest point, the highest peak he could find from where he lived so that he could open up his hands and with assistance, stand and worship God at the highest peak. And Lenny and Bobby drove him to Mount Mitchell, to the highest spot they could get to, and helped him up out of his chair, and let him worship for as long as he wanted to worship. If a man who's dying can do that, then why can't we who are alive in Christ offer him the praise that he is due when we are here together? or at home. Let's pray. You know, this morning, Heavenly Father, I was talking to Al, and Al, I was sharing with him about the message from last week and how it touched the life of Betty's son-in-law and from 3,000 miles away. And Al said, well, then we're going to pray that's going to touch someone here today. And I said... It may even be for me. I don't know why you placed me here. Because I feel so unworthy. But I know that you placed me here because I have a God who's worthy, whom, who I can rely on to take the steps necessary to lead your people, your flock. You shepherd through me. But as I said earlier, Heavenly Father, I cannot ever expect them to go somewhere where I'm not leading first. And sitting in that front pew, you nailed me. And it's been hard not to deliver this sermon until this date. I pray your will is accomplished. I pray ears were open. I pray, pray that hearts were receiving, that we're not just challenged, dear Heavenly Father, but we're changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We give you the worship that you have been denied. It will change our lives. It will change our marriages. It will change this church. It can change this community. It can change this nation. Just by the simple act of following what you asked to worship you. So now, Heavenly Father, let that be a part of our lives. In the morning when we wake up, let us worship you. 
In the middle of the day, let us worship you. Before we go to sleep at night, let us worship you. And when we come together, let us worship you in spirit and in truth. Despite the temp, despite the weather, despite the style of song, despite the music, we worship you. Keep this message on our hearts as we go our separate ways. Heavenly Father, please keep us safe. I don't want to miss anybody next week because they were taken home before their time or before I had a chance to say goodbye. Bring us back at the appointed time, Tuesday's Bible study, and right after that is prayer, and we have things to do. Keep us healthy and holy. Keep us united. In that name we pray, amen.